Whenever you hear of bad acting or bad performances especially, a number of names are inevitably brought up in conversation. John Travolta as Turl from Battlefield Earth, Halle Berry as Catwoman from, well, Catwoman, and any role that has Mike Myers doing a Scottish accent. But sometimes, an actor's performance becomes so legendarily bad that it's awe-inspiring. Bruce Campbell, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Red Brown to a lesser extent. I defy you to watch any one of their movies and not be entertained. But for my money... No one actor does this better than Nicholas fucking Cage. Shoot him again. What fool? His soul's still dancing. When he's in his element chewing mountains upon mountains of scenery, he becomes so unavoidable my ass literally sweats glue and sticks itself to my seat. He's the only actor I know of who can not only pull off pump kicking a bitch in the chest, but also pull off smacking another one right in the kisser, while wearing a fucking bear suit in the same goddamn movie. Yeah. How to get burned? How to get burned? I, how to get burned? How to get burned? I don't know. And that's why I love and hate Deadfall, an infamous movie of Cage's back from the early '90s, directed by his brother Chris Coppola of all people, and starring Michael Bane, James Coburn, Peter Fonda. Charlie Sheen? What the fuck? They couldn't find a more mismatched cast if they hired William Shatner. <laughs> First off, this movie has to be on the cheapest DVD ever produced. There's no subtitling options, no trailers, not even a goddamn still gallery. But it does have the option to skip the entire movie to the ending credits, which has to be the DVD equivalent of taking a cyanide capsule. Anyways, the movie begins with Kyle Reese, oh, uh, uh, I mean Joe, heard narrating his role as a con man. I played the all-American boy. People thought they could pull the wool over my eyes. Well, that was my con, and it never failed. My god, if my delivery were more flat and stilted, my name would be Kevin Costner. Anyways, he leads cigar-chomping Ernest Borgnine here to his partner in crime and father, played by James Coburn. Before he hands over the money, though, he demands a taste of the goods. I'm seeing angels. Man, is he going to be pissed when he finds out that's just MSG. So, Cigar Guy gives him the money, but before the exchange can be made, Coburn lets on that he's wired and shots start ringing out. The police come storming into the warehouse before shooting Joe, while Fatty here has ten heart attacks as he barely manages to hustle his ass out of there. He's not dead, is he? <laughs> yeah, you see, this might have been suspenseful and everything if we didn't already know that this was supposed to be a con. And this wasn't six and a half minutes into the movie. And if this movie didn't suck. But the celebration over conning a guy out of 50 grand is cut short when it's discovered that the blanks inside Joe's gun are actual bullets, and his father lies dying on the floor. Get it. Get the cake. My brother took the cake. Must. Resist. Portal joke. So, yeah, Joe goes into conniptions over killing his father and has to be dragged away. We catch up with him after his father's funeral, where one of the conmen, played by Peter Fonda, gives Joe what was on his father when he died. Why the hell he had a locker key on him, I don't know, but who cares? It's Peter Fonda! Finally this movie can get interesting. See ya. Wait, 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 don't go! Don't go! Don't leave me with fucking Michael Bain! <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to mention this, but about half the actors I named earlier just have cameos and have at maximum 10 or 12 lines. In fact, that's one of the selling points of the fucking DVD. I quote, Joining the first-rate cast of characters are stunning cameo appearances by Charlie Sheen, Peter Fonda, and Talia Shire. See ya. 
So Joe takes the key to a bus stop locker room, where he miraculously divined its location using only a freaking locker key as his guide. Inside the locker, he finds an address book and a suitcase, each giving him clues about his uncle. So he decides to hop on a bus to Santa Monica to find the uncle he never knew he had, all the while being watched by... <laughs> Okay, okay. A uh, guy, Amish farmer, might not have been the best choice for this guy's. So Joe winds up in a boardwalk, trying to find any leads he can about the whereabouts of his uncle Lou. Hey kid, what's your name? Mitch. You wanna make an easy 20 bucks, Mitch? <laughs> for what? Change your name to Shirley and meet me in my hotel room. <laughs> Actually, no. Joe just tells the kid to get him into contact with Lou. This opens all sorts of questions, like why in the hell would Joe think that a busboy at a boardwalk would know anything about his uncle, but all of that is rendered moot when you-know-who finally shows up. Bigger card. Just... look at him. Obvious toupee, puke green leisure suit, cheesy mustache, cheap wraparound sunglasses, and a voice that sounds like Batman on Quaaludes? Joker. Joker. <sighs> Nick Cage is fucking mystifying in this movie. I'm not sure if the script called for his character to be this completely baffling, or if it's just Nick Cage deciding that if he has to be in his brother's crappy movie, he's gonna do it in the most over-the-top, out-of-control way possible. This fucking fucker's fucked! Well, at least he was a lively fellow. Anyways, Nick here leads Joe to his uncle, who runs the boardwalk market as a front for his shady business dealings. In a turn more predictable than the fucking tides, it turns out his uncle is his father's twin. I think this has less to do with wanting to give Joe a sense of alarming dread and more to do with the producers not having enough money to hire another actor. When did you go out with Eddie tonight? Huh? Oh, yes. Why don't you? What do you think? So the two head out, but not before picking up Nick Cage's girlfriend, played by Sarah Trigger. Yes, that same Sarah Trigger who, earlier this year, allegedly hired a hitman to kill her ex-husband, John Cryer. However, it's still up in the air about which is worse. Being accused of offing your husband, or appearing in deadfall. Well, anyway, the three go out about town, making a stop at a bar tended by Talia Shire. They con her out of $200 in a scene that is completely pointless and time-wasting. The movie is barely 90 minutes long, and they still have to pad the movie out with these pointless cameos. I mean... STUNNING CAMEOS! We're sorry. You have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. Anyways, the three continue on their night when they- OH MY GOD! Ah! 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 Tell me when it's over! Ah! Okay. <sighs> okay. Okay, I'm good, I'm good. Nick here uh, decides to take Joe on a shakedown run and tells him to collect the money owed by this big black guy named Baby. At least that's what I think is happening, but I can't tell from being distracted by the topless dancer in the background, dancing to the cheesiest metal song featured in a movie since fucking Hobgoblins. So yeah, Joe gets the money from Baby, much to the surprise and chagrin of Nick, and much to the delight of Sarah Trigger here, elated at the prospect of having a boyfriend who doesn't sniff glue, or whatever that's supposed to be. Afterwards, Joe goes to his hotel room where Sarah has a bit of a surprise waiting for him. Open your eyes, Joe. Oh, thank God it's finally you. I've been waiting here for over two hours. I nearly propositioned the cleaning lady twice. 
Yeah, you can already tell where this is going. The two have sex, really horribly shot, awkward, and unappealing sex. Trust me, I'm doing you a favor by censoring this, unless you really want to see Sarah Trigger's flapjack tits. Anyway, the next day, Joe gives the collected money to his uncle at his house, where he also meets the most annoying woman in the world. <laughs> oh, Blanche, what is this? What are, you, what are you doing here? You know how I... Come on, what's all the fuss? Oh my god, I think she just invented a new crime. Ear rape. Thankfully, we don't stay with him too long as we cut back to Nick Cage's one-man show back at the strip club where he's accosted by Baby again and reveals that he never actually paid Joe the money and that it was all just a ruse so that Joe could take over Nick's job. And what happens next is... I'm not gonna lie, the ugliest, most hilarious meltdown ever featured in a film. Pop some popcorn, call your friends, and have CPR on standby. If you thought the B scene in Wicker Man was Nick Cage's crown jewel performance, you haven't seen anything yet. Get out! Yeah. I got Dead puppies, dead puppies. Oh. Emo Jones, Emo Jones. Oh. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. I'm good, I'm good. And if that wasn't enough, the Amish guy finally makes himself known by attacking Nick Cage after he exits, but he manages to overpower the attacker. <laughs> From here on, it's all about Nick Cage and this ballistic tantrum he's on. He's simply out of control. It gets to the point that even the other actors look uncomfortable just being on the same set with him, and I couldn't be any happier. Even the fact that the camera clearly shows the top of the walls of the soundstage they're on doesn't detract away from the fact that Nick Cage has attained godhood. Eddie, it's really not what you think. Shut up! Shut the fuck up! <laughs> oh, you have fucking no man! I guess the point of that scene was for Nick to discover his girlfriend's infidelity? I don't know. I seriously don't know. It's like Chris Coppola got his brother high on angel dust and told the camera guy to film whatever came out of him. So, Nick Cage continues going buttfuck and holds Joe's uncle at gunpoint, screaming at him to pick a card and something about Joker's wild... I, I don't know anymore, guys. I, I think I'm losing my mind here. This is about Joe? Oh, God. Eddie, after, after all we've been through together? Come on, man. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I, I gotta get that as my ringtone. Bullshit. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right. Now, if someone would just call me. So Nick has Joe's uncle bound and gagged back at the boardwalk, but luckily Joe comes around and saves the day by tackling Nick and then dunking his head into a vat of boiling oil. That's right. He pulls a KFC on Nick fucking Cage. 
Wow. <laughs> what a way to go. I mean, Nick Cage was a lot of fun. I mean, he basically saved the movie from being totally unwatchable. I mean, that hour and a half just flew. Eddie was a key player in a, in a job that I've been planning for six months. He's supposed to bring in the mark. Wait, movie, what are you doing? The villain is dead. You killed him. You dunked his head into a deep fryer. You don't get much more dead than that. I need somebody to bring in the mark. It's the classic possum trap, man. No, no, hold on, hold on. How far are we into this? An hour? You mean I gotta sit through another half hour of this bullshit without Nick Cage? No! A thousand times no! 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 God, Ted falls a bitch. <sighs> okay. So, Joe is propositioned by his uncle to carry out the con that Nick Cage was supposed to do, and he reluctantly agrees. Later that night, after a spaz attack with Sarah Trigger, he goes into this weird flashback sequence. What is this? Is he remembering Nam or something? Uh, maybe I'm complaining too much. I mean, we've all had Vietnam flashbacks from time to... You had to be there, man. Cutting back to the present, we finally find out what the deal was with the cake from a while back. Turns out the cake Joe's father was referring to was a cake-shaped box that held an engagement ring that his uncle was going to give to Joe's mother before his father took her away from him. Not sure what the hell this has to do with the rest of the movie, but then again, I don't even know what the movie has to do with the fucking movie. Anywho, his uncle fills him in on the new target of the con, a diamond collector who specializes in stolen diamonds. But before he can talk to him, he has to play English billiards with Charlie Sheen for seven minutes. That's right. You heard me. A seven minute cameo revolving around watching this. After that bit of indulgence, Joe is finally ushered to see the Diamond Collector, who I swear must have just stepped out of a bad James Bond film, or any Roger Moore Bond film. Seriously, was the scissor hand that necessary? Jake. So they square a deal, and Joe comes back to his uncle, as him and the crew go over the final details of their plan to heist two million dollars and keep the diamonds. Oh no, the movie's starting over! Shit! gun so yeah they have a basic repeat of the beginning of the movie but this time when the uncle lets on that he's wired joe was unable to pull the trigger of the gun with the blanks flashing back to the night with his father which leaves his uncle open to the real bullets being fired by the diamond guy's henchmen oh whoops all hell breaks loose as the fake police and the lackeys fire on each other, while Joe grabs the money and runs to safety. And that's when the movie pulls one of the biggest cop-out pieces of bullshit I have ever seen. Joe runs into an old warehouse, where it's revealed that his father wasn't dead after all, and that this whole thing was just a con to get his uncle's money from the diamond heist. What? Okay, one, how the hell did he know that his brother was planning a diamond heist? Two, why did he have to trick his son into thinking that he killed him to steal said money? Three, why was it necessary to pay off Sarah Trigger in this plan? She didn't do shit. Four, how would you know that he'd let his uncle die or that he would bother picking up the money from the shootout? Five, why the fuck is this all taking place on a goddamn carousel? Shit in Christ, I haven't seen a movie so dependent on pure dumb luck since Forrest fucking Gump. And so, with the news broken to him, Joe goes on a ragegasm and threatens his dad with the gun he was given back at the diamond heist. He fires, but it turns out his gun was loaded with blanks, in an almost Shakespearean turn of events. You know, if Shakespeare was a moron. He leaves his dad fumbling through the spilled cash. End. Fuck. This. Movie. It's a worthless, boring, bloated, infuriating movie. 
easily one of the worst I've ever seen. The only saving grace is that Nick Cage is fucking unbelievable in this. And every single second he's on screen is pure magic. Unfortunately, he's only in half this movie. And when he's killed off, the movie literally limps its way to the ending. Almost as if there was no ending beyond him getting killed. And they stretched out as much bullshit as they possibly could to make the film feature length. This is a deplorable example of a movie. Insulting, even. But you know, when all is said and done, I did come away with something special. Bullshit. 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 Oh, <laughs> <laughs>